to this uh, 15th webinar on compound extremes. It's great to have you all here. We just discussed that this is uh, actually the uh, second anniversary today, more or less um, by the day. So two years of risk and compound uh, extreme webinars, um, pretty exciting Jubilee. And uh, we have two um, great speakers here today with us. Um, overall, we're going to hear about uh, droughts and floods and the human uh, contribution to both. Um, our first speaker is going to be uh, Maurizio Mazzolini, um, who's an assistant professor at the Freie University uh, in Amsterdam. And after hearing his talk, We'll hear from Antonia Sebastian, who is uh, a professor at um, University of North Carolina. Um, after both talks, who will be more or less 20, 25 minutes or so, we'll have some time for a joint discussion and a Q&A, and hopefully, you know, some interesting um, overarching discussion will develop. So without further ado, uh, Maurizio, um, I'm inviting you to join your, uh, to share your screen, uh, unmute your mic and start your um, presentation. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, perfect. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for, uh, for inviting me to the RISCAN webinar. And Today, I will show you some um, results of our latest uh, studies on uh, quantifying the human influence on the impacts of consecutive events using, in particular, a modeling approach. This is uh, a part of my research uh, here at Fry University, in which I'm focused mainly on understanding the dynamics between human and water using both a modeling approach, but also a global data set analysis. So it has been uh, um, already observed that uh, compound events uh, have, uh, have increased both uh, in frequency and intensity over the last decades. And here I report a couple of studies that uh, actually just prove this point. And in particular, we can see that uh, in, the, in the bottom part of the, of the slide, one study showed that there is uh, an increase in the likelihood of uh, extreme hot uh, to dry event. Compound events, we can have different type of compound events. It can be hot to dry, or it can be hot to wet, or also dry to, to wet events. And this situation is particularly exacerbated by the fact that uh, climate change uh, due to anthropogenic influence is, uh, is actually increasing the occurrence and the, and the frequency of such compound events. This has been um, widely demonstrated, and here I uh, show you three main examples and because of three main studies, and because of the, the, the increase or, uh, or the occurrence of compound events, we can also expect that in the future there will be, there will be higher societal impact due to compound events. So based on all these studies and, uh, and results, my question was like, can we ignore human action if beside the, the influence of uh, greenhouse gas emission or anthropogenic climate change, can we ignore human action when assessing compound risk? And in particular, how can human action influence the, the occurrence or the intensity of different compound events? In this presentation, we'll focus mainly on one type of compound events that are consecutive events. And in particular, I will focus on drought to flood events that uh, can be uh, defined as um, the pro a prolonged drought period follow shortly followed by an intense flood event. Here I just summarized the location of some um, um, of some drought to flood event. That actually this is the premier results of the Perfect Storm project. It's an ERC project led by Dr. Ram Valloon here at Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam. So when talking about humans, we should uh, understand uh, the or we should include the mutual shaping between ideological extremes and society. We know that ideological extreme can affect society, but on the other hand, society can also uh, exacerbate and uh, shape ideological extreme for like, for example, floods and droughts. In fact, if we consider the influence of or the effect of uh, extreme events on society, we already know that uh, 
if we consider, for example, drought, or oh, sorry, floods, these are one of the main natural hazards that are affecting uh, humans the most, for example, in causing billions in terms of damages or uh, affecting uh, millions of people every year worldwide. So the effect of uh, extreme events on society is widely known, but few studies assess or consider the influence of society on extreme events. And we know that uh, humans are, are actually altering both frequency, magnitude, and also distribution of hydrological extremes. They can do it deliberately by constructing, for example, levees or reservoir or dams, or not deliberately when uh, we consider uh, urbanization processes or uh, deforestation. If we consider, for example, the, v, the construction of the system urbanization, this uh, has a um, high influence on the hydrological processes and the runoff generation. For example, considering the case of uh, the Po River, that is the main river in Italy, we saw that we observed uh, over the last uh, decades that have been uh, a significant, significant increase in the, um, in the river system along the river. This can be observed here with the red and uh, green plots. And because of this reinforcement upstream, we also observe an increase in the discharge downstream uh, of that particular point that, for example, was at here at Ponte Lago Scuro, that is the, the outlet of the river basin. So the fact that we construct a levee upstream to, in order to protect a particular uh, area or a city does not reduce or does not eliminate the, the flood risk downstream. And because of the different dynamics between uh, extreme events and society, we can, we can um, we can see the emergence of different type of phenomena. Here I just show, uh, just report six phenomena that can be adaptation effects, the effect or reservoir effect and so on. For example, the levee effect, uh, it emerges when uh, constructing a levee system to, in order to protect urbanized area, we also observe a reduction in the flood awareness of the people because they are less aware about uh, the possible occurrence of flooding. And because of, of this, the society will tend to increase the urbanized area next to the floodplain or next to the levee system. However, this does not eliminate or um, eliminate the risk of flooding because in case of a levee breach and the high urbanization, we will actually have higher flood risk and higher damages. And similarly, we can have a, uh, the reservoir effect in which um, society will decide to build more reservoir in order to cope with droughts. But because of the presence of this reservoir, people will actually increase their water demand and uh, even maybe increase urbanized area. And, be, and during drought condition, the reservoir may not be able to cope with the higher demand of water and there will be higher water shortages because of the higher demand. Among these processes, or uh, sorry, these phenomena, today I would like to focus more on the sequence effect that emerges when uh, we are in, in the case of uh, consecutive events like drought followed by a flood. And this phenomena have been observed uh, globally, and this is just an example of uh, the location of few of this, uh, of this phenomena. So the next question is, how can we assess the human influence in case of consecutive events? This has been done uh, over the last decades by using sociological modeling. And uh, in particular, this model has been used for uh, uh, quantify the human water interaction to then uh, assess the, the societal water risk. These are just two examples of the many sociological processes that have been developed. However, these models, they focus on one specific hydrological extreme. So they focus either on floods or drought, and they do not consider consecutive uh, or multiple hazards. That's why this research or, uh, well, this research was, um, was developed in order to to create or develop a new system dynamic model or a new sociological model that uh, will represent the dynamics between human and consecutive events in case of uh, um, multiple uh, mitigation strategies. And how we do that? We, we did it by considering a synthetic case in which uh, we have a urbanized area downstream. We can sit here with the number five in which there is a reservoir upstream that is used both for flood, for flood control and water supply purposes. So the people, the society can decide to cope with the drought and floods 
by implementing or adopting four different water management strategies. They can decide to do basically nothing. They take no action in case of a drought or a flood occur. They can decide to focus on the fighting floods in, and this would be done by building a levee system that here is represented with number seven. They can decide to reduce their water, uh, water use, so reduce the water consumption, or they can decide to have more uh, water exploitation strategies, so looking for more reservoir or building or um, relying on uh, other type of uh, water supply, like the salination plants. And in order to represent this dynamic, we first uh, uh, design a causal loop. So we identify all the dynamics that uh, can occur both between the physical system and the social system. And in particular, we focus on, uh, we divide our model in uh, four main systems. First, we have the reservoir system in which the main inflow are, uh, is the discharge and the outflow is both the downstream, res the downstream flow in the river and also the withdrawal for the water supply. There is the, the, re the release from the reservoir is, uh, is driven both by the awareness of the reservoir operator, but also by the demand downstream from the urbanized area. Then we have a drought system that includes all the dynamics in terms of drought awareness and um, uh, water use of the population. And then we have, uh, we have a flooding system in which in the same way we calculate the flood awareness or the flood damage that can occur in case of a flood event or NLV breach. And then we have a main, uh, where we have a connecting system that is the population system that connects both drought and, um, and, flood, and flood systems. These dynamics are represented by a series of differential equations that uh, I'm not going to show now because there are way many equations. And then uh, the model is based on um, about 15 parameters that are, that are not calibrated using um, observed uh, data, but mainly on, um, on the literature review, so on similar studies. We decided to apply the, the model to the case of, of Brisbane. We, we did so because Brisbane was affected by a long, uh, drought period that was uh, that occurred between 2000 and 2010 and was called the millennium drought after that uh, in uh, 2011 the there has been the, the occurrence of intense precipitation and this caused a severe flood event in the downstream area however the the the, the flooding in the downstream area was both generated by the by the intense precipitation but also by the unoptimal um, management of the reservoir upstream Brisbane. That is because uh, the, the reservoir was still managed in case of drought conditions. So it was kept as full as possible in order to deal with future drought condition. But because of, um, so the reservoir was full, was well, not full, but still with a high amount of water and the flood event occurred. So there was not enough uh, retention capacity to, to store the flood event. So we apply the model in, uh, in two cases. So we first run the model, we test the model using um, historical analysis on the Brisbane case study and tested both using quantitative and qualitative uh, data of flood awareness and drought awareness. And then we run a synthetic analysis based on a longer time series considering a different series of uh, occurrence of floods and drought events. If we consider the historical analysis, we see that uh, here I, I plot uh, five of the main model outcome. And the, with the different color, we see the different water, um, water management strategies. I would like you to focus on one strategy that is the water conservation. So we see that in case of water conservation, so the people is using less water during droughts, we actually observe a higher volume in the reservoir because they are using less water. So there is less release from the reservoir. And because of this higher volume, we can then see um, a higher value of affected population when the flood occur. And this is actually what happened in reality. And this analysis was possible because we couple both floods and drought system. So in this way, the, the drought management strategies has an effect also when, uh, when a flood will occur. And this was not done with previous sociological models. If we then move to the synthetic analysis, so in which we take a longer time series of, um, 
of uh, drought and flood events. So this is based on uh, synthetic uh, time series. We see that the model is actually capable of um, or represent different type of human water phenomena. That in this case, we see the occurrence of uh, supply demand cycle and the reservoir effect. But we also see that, uh, that uh, drought management strategies as the, for example, here we see it in the orange line, is actually an effect on, uh, on the opposite hazard, that is floods. So if we consider the initial question on uh, how human action have influenced the risk of, uh, well, in this case, consecutive events, we can actually answer that uh, flood and drought awareness has a significant impact on the emergency of uh, these complex dynamics between uh, human and consecutive events. And coupling the floods and drought system actually allow to quantify the impact of different management strategies that are uh, first adopted for uh, one, uh, one hazard, but is actually an effect on the opposite hazard. So we can conclude that this model is a valuable uh, explanatory tool in order to assess a future possible trajectory and support uh, sustainable water management strategies. So after this, I have actually a question for you that we can uh, maybe discuss later. And the question is, should we ignore human adaptation actions like the one I showed you before when assessing future compound risk? So not only focusing on anthropogenic climate change, but also should, should we include this human adaptation action for assessing future compound risks? And well, for this, I would like to thank you. And if you have any question, please. All right. Yeah. Thank, thanks so much, Maurizio. That was, uh, that was a very um, thought-provoking talk. And uh, I, I also love this image to represent the um, feedbacks <laughs> yeah, in the system that are, that are very well integrated in there, but, you know, so important to try to um, understand kind of which hand is doing what uh, in this figure. Um, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think we'll have a joint uh, Q&A. Uh, after the second talk, so hopefully um, that works for everybody. Um, we we found that makes things more exciting. Um, sorry, my dog is playing with a toy. Um, so our second talk is going to be by Antonia Sebastian, who is an assistant professor at the University of uh, North Carolina, and she leads the flood hydrology and hazards lab there. Um, and her work considers how to best understand complex flooding risks, including those that are enhanced by urbanization um, and with large financial impacts. And particularly, uh, she's had a bunch of studies published about Hurricane Harvey. So Antonia, um, please uh, go ahead. And yeah, we're looking forward to discussing both talks uh, after. Are you able to see? the full version. Awesome. Yep. Um, all right. Well, thank you for the invitation. I um, have been uh, really looking forward to this for a while. And um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the work that I did after Hurricane Harvey. And I'm going to connect it um, to some of the work that Maurizio talked about today. I think these two talks go together really nicely. And, ho and hopefully I don't answer the question too much about um, whether we should consider humans. Um, so my talk today is going to focus on um, attributing coastal flood hazards, uh, broadly defined as floods that affect coastal places, uh, to human and environmental change. And I'm going to provide some insights from a case study that we did on Hurricane Harvey and try to tie it more broadly to um, compound flooding and thinking about the role of development in compound coastal flooding. So if I can get my slides to switch. Um, a little bit of background on Houston, since that's what we're talking about today. Um, Houston's history is fairly short. It uh, was founded in 1836, but its history is also um, very tightly tied with flood events. So if you look at this graphic, which I um, adapted from something that Harris County Flood Control District put out, um, you see decadal flood events uh, shown on the top. It's a variety of sort of intense precipitation or storm events, as well as uh, hurricanes and surge events that have happened over time. Um, and the responses that have been made in order to adapt to the flooding that is occurring in the Houston area or mitigate the flooding. And so you see here um, in the early 1900s, 
that we had two major hurricanes. The 1900 Galveston hurricane, if you don't know, uh, is the deadliest hurricane in US history. It killed about 8,000 people that were living on Galveston Island at the time. And in the response, um, it spurred the construction of the Galveston seawall, as well as the dredging of the Houston Ship Channel. So if it weren't for this hurricane, Houston wouldn't exist because the center of Houston moved from Galveston inland to be more protected, but also uh, better connected to the resources that were there. And this really spurred population growth in the region, which is shown here as this green line. Um, and you see over time that with every major storm event, so these 1900 hurricanes, um, floods in the 1940s, other hurricanes in the 1960s, there was some major construction that happened in response to these events that further enabled the city to grow and populate um, both uh, in terms of demographic, so population growth, and in terms of uh, economic growth and potential for the city. Um, and this sort of pattern of flooding, adaptation, population growth continues today, um, but has really culminated in the Hurricane Harvey event. So the 2000s um, and the 2010s are more characterized by um, an increase in awareness, uh, change in technology associated with uh, mapping and understanding our hazards that has um, led to sort of a growth in population in these flood prone areas. So um, this is just sort of the dynamic of Houston over time. And as I mentioned, it really, uh, the 2010s were a really active period with multiple events that culminated with Hurricane Harvey, which is a record setting event that caught global attention um, because it was so extreme. So it's the highest recorded rainfall event in US history. Um, with about, for the Europeans on the call, one and a half meters of water uh, in the Houston Galveston region, or about 60 and a half inches um, of precipitation. Um, it's the highest five day rainfall over the continental US, it caused the largest number of direct deaths from a Texas storm since uh, 1919, since the tropical cyclone that hit Galveston in 1919. Um, and it elicited the largest uh, disaster response in Texas history impacting upwards of about 13 million people across the state and the region. Um, and the storm was not only significant in terms of its impact, but also uh, meteorologically, it was a very interesting event um, because of not only the amount of rain that it dropped, but the meteorologic conditions that led to the stalling pattern that generated that amount of precipitation. Um, and it also raised a lot of questions about the role of climate change in, um, let's say, preconditioning uh, the, the area to um, such an extreme event. And so I was involved in a study um, with the World Weather Attribution Organization to rapidly attribute Harvey's precipitation to global warming. Um, I am not a climatologist by training or a meteorologist by training. So the role that I played in this study was really to provide context for the exposure and the vulnerability components of this analysis. But what I want to point out is that using several uh, historical data sets of um, precipitation in the region and across um, the Gulf Coast, as well as uh, gridded reanalysis data sets and climate models, um, the study enabled us to conclusively determine that global warming made Harvey's precipitation about 15% more intense, or equivalently that Harvey was three times more likely in today's climate than in the historical climate. And there were several other studies that came out at about the same time that had very similar findings. So this was, these were not unique in the context of the literature that was coming out rapidly in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. Um, based on my own research, however, this didn't really um, answer questions that I had been posing throughout my PhD work and was still interested in at the time of Harvey, which was um, while we you know, recognize the role that climate change is playing in increasing precipitation potential, um, what's the role of land use and urbanization in driving the flooding that occurred during Hurricane Harvey. And I think the study, the Van Oldenburg study um, that attributed Hurricane Harvey's rainfall to climate change sort of left that question at the end. We opened that question at the end of the paper really to say, um, you know, we recognize that there were 15% uh, more precipitation, but how does that play out in the vulnerability and the exposure in the region to, uh, as a result of also all of the development that had occurred over the previous century and a half. And so um, 
if you look here, uh, or here's a little bit of more evidence, if you look here on the left hand side of the screen, you can see uh, a plot showing population and urbanization in blue and pink um, growing over time as natural and agricultural areas have decreased. And as hydrologists, we recognize that increases in urbanized area um, and decreases in forested or um, agricultural area lead to faster runoff and less infiltration. And so we expect to see higher volumes of water as well as um, faster flood waves moving through our system as these changes take place. And on the right hand side, you can see um, annual extremes at gauges at four significant gauges in the Houston region. Um, and you can see that at most of these gauges or at the gauges that are shown here, there's pretty visual um, increase in runoff or in observed peak flows at these locations, um, culminating again in this Hurricane Harvey event. At a few of these gauges, you also see here in the early 30s, or in the early 20s, that there um, were a couple of extreme events. But what I will note about this gauge location is that there were some reservoirs built in 1935. Um, and that's why you see sort of this um, drop off where you don't see these events occur again until Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey was the only event where the reservoirs, uh, where water was released from the reservoirs during any flood. So that's kind of what's going on in this image. Um, and so in order to sort of answer this question about what the role of urbanization was in flooding during Hurricane Harvey, our goal was to reconstruct um, sort of the historical hydroclimate of the region or of the city of Houston. And the primary challenge that we had in setting up this experiment was trying to find historical data that could represent the region in the early 1900s. So we had relatively good information on how um, precipitation had changed, but the question was, you know, what was the pre-development land use like? And so we collected maps from uh, the library at the University of Texas and used them to sort of generate, use them together with uh, historical aerial imagery to generate the 1900s condition uh, for the region. And we also found an old report um, from the 1930s about significant flood events during that time period, which enabled us to get a little bit of gauge location with which we could validate our models. And so um, for the hydrologists in the room, just really quickly, we use this distributed hydrologic model from view and view. It uses kinematic wave overland routing, um, and there's some options for channelized routing in the model. Um, here we used uh, modified poles because it has been used in other studies in the region. And I will say that this model was used in numerous other studies in the region um, and had been validated for a couple of different storm events. And it's a high resolution model. So it enables us to really look at localized or small scale changes in land use land cover and their effects on flooding downstream. And we could also represent the, the reservoirs that had been built in the model um, using sort of stage discharge relationships at those locations. And so our goal again was to create this historical model um, by turning back time on the land use that had occurred and also turning back time on the precipitation. Um, and so we recreated these historical land use land cover maps and channel um, roughness in order to represent those pre-development conditions. And we had access to one calibration event uh, from the 1930s, I think it occurred in 1935, um, that we could use to look at the performance of our model. And so for those of you who are not hydrologists, our goal is to see how well our model can rep replicate the shape and the timing and the peak flow from the storm event. So we had one hydrograph to look at and a couple of high water marks. And overall, we felt like for a model for 100 years ago, we we're performing pretty okay. And we did the same thing for the current condition. So we used 2016 land use land cover and the Harvey event to um, validate our model. And we also had access to three recent storm events in Houston record that um, we used. And here um, you can see, uh, I believe this is the Harvey event, that there it's a three peak storm, which means it's a little bit harder to capture, but our model performed pretty well over time. And so um, once we were pretty confident that we had models to represent the historical hydroclimate and the current hydroclimate, 
um, we generated six model scenarios in which we turned on and off these parameters that we were interested in. So our experimental design was really to look at the individual contributions of land use, land cover, climate, and the combined contribution of both. We also, um, for the sake of just better understanding our system, took the reservoirs in and out of the model. So we had some with and without reservoir scenarios that we looked at. And to represent the climate, we just increased the precipitation, we scaled the precipitation by 15% to represent uh, that change in climate. And here you can see the results. Um, and the key things to look at here are that, um, you know, the reservoirs did have a significant event when comparing, let me back up. Um, you, we have three columns. There's a precipitation only column, a development only column, and the combined precipitation and development column. And we also have these rows with represent uh, the change in the system without any reservoirs and the change in the system when you do include the reservoirs. And so um, just a couple of things to note here, uh, the reservoirs do have a significant influence on decreasing or a significant benefit to communities downstream. Um, we also saw the greatest increases as a result of the combined scenario, but especially development when compared against precipitation. And the increases were also greatest in areas that were downstream of areas that had been downstream of tributaries that had been channelized. So these gray areas represent um, channeli channelization um, in the form of straightening and also concrete lining these tributaries. So here where these red dots are, these tended to be downstream of these channelized areas, which Mauricio in his presentation also mentioned um, that while channelization has been used to locally reduce flooding, it can increase flooding further downstream. Um, when we aggregate these results over all of the gauges in the Houston area, um, you can also see, we also looked at changes in discharge, volume, um, and timing. Um, so we see here that uh, across all scenarios, our discharges increased, but the greatest increases were for the combined scenario. Uh, development relative to climate change was much bigger. I think, actually, I think we have some results here um, that climate and development together increased peak discharges across the system by about 1.8 times. Uh, climate change was about 20% on its own. Um, development was about um, 80% on its own, 80 or 90% on its own, and together their combined effects were greater than either individually. Um, development didn't really have a significant impact on flood volume. This is probably because the system or the soils in this area are already quite clayey, so they don't infiltrate a lot of water anyways, um, even after they've been paid over, paved over, although paving had a big influence on timing. Um, but a 15% increase in precipitation yielded about an 18% increase in volume. Um, and then we also saw that climate and development decreased time to peak by about 13 hours. And in a few minutes, I'll explain why this might be relevant for compound flooding. Um, so just a couple of findings and takeaways from this study. Uh, we saw that the changes um, in runoff volume and timing were greatest in the areas that had experienced significant channelization. We observed some attenuation of the peak discharge as we moved across scales in the waterside. So the larger the scale, um, the less the influence on peak discharges. But we also found the opposite for volume. So those cumulative impacts as you go farther downstream in the watershed were greater. Um, what our kind of primary takeaway from the study was that there's a loss in adaptive capacity of the entire system as a result of that development. Basically, um, the development is sort of preconditioning the system to uh, negatively reflect the climate change increases. So um, the climate change on top of the development is worse than if you just had the climate change on its own. Um, and uh, this also raised a lot of questions about the role of channelization and combined with urbanization. So thinking a lot about that sort of levy effect, but in response to channelization, as channelization occurs, you're um, influencing your, or you're promoting encroachment along the channel because people perceive those areas to be safer. Um, and it also uh, facilitates development in upstream areas. And so I just want to point out that we worked on a parallel study um, at around this time. And I think Asvin Tikagori is on the call. She was also involved in both of these studies. Um, and we asked the question about whether or not some flood 
uh, mitigation alternatives are really maladaptive over the long term. And so we picked out two, we, in Houston, these areas are called bayous, but basically tributaries of the Houston area uh, that had very similar um, sizes, soil types, characteristics, development patterns, uh, but entirely different flood mitigation strategies. So in this top watershed called Buffalo Bayou, um, the main channel has been mostly, there's been a little bit of channelization, but no concrete lining, and the channel has been left mostly in its natural state. And there are some significant buffer zones around this channel, whereas in the lower watershed or the southernmost watershed shown here, Braze Bayou, um, the channel has been entirely channelized, concrete lined, um, and probably worth noting a lot of this uh, watershed, there's been a lot of uh, storm infrastructure built to facilitate the flow of water into these bayou systems. So we've sped up water through the system in order to mitigate the flooding. So here we have kind of a hold back setback scenario and a speed up uh, scenario down at the bottom. And when we look at development in these watersheds over time, we see that they um, have experienced fairly similar patterns of development. Um, or of change in undeveloped area into developed area. So they're not significantly different in terms of their development patterns, just how and where the watersheds have been developed. And when we modeled these under um, changing development patterns, uh, we actually saw that in the channelized bayou, um, the floodplain grew substantially, whereas in the unchannelized bayou, it did not, suggesting that this channelized um, or the channelization might be maladaptive over the long term. So here in this bottom scenario, we're seeing between 1970 and projected out to 2040, uh, five-fold increase in flooding uh, or in the extent of the 100-year floodplain. Um, and uh, so kind of coming to the, the point of risk can in these talks is why might this matter for um, compound flooding? So, um, in, in the Harvey scenario, and I think across all the floods that we've recently seen in the Houston region, we're finding that land use, land cover change, or urbanization, equivalently urbanization or development, however you want to think about it, is loading the dice for more extreme flooding. Um, so it's like preconditioning the system for flooding. Um, in general, we're seeing that land use, land cover contributions to peak flows are attenuated at larger scales, but that they are very important for these smaller tributaries, um, particularly those that might have a coastal outlet. So the compound effects in these coastal outlets where you have um, faster runoff and higher storm surge are much greater than further upstream in the larger tributaries. And in this Houston area where you're um, developing rapidly along the coastline, this might be very significant for the type of flooding that we see going forward. Um, most of the studies on future coastal flood risk have focused on climate change and when they consider development it's mostly considering the change in exposure that might be happening um, in coastal areas but uh, we've shown here and it's sort of my belief that land use land cover is significant in um, influencing the timing and particularly the floodplain extent in these coastal areas so as um, our flood wave from upstream areas increases uh, in magnitude and moves earlier in time, the probability of peak on peak events um, between surge and runoff is increasing. And potentially the magnitude of the flood extent or the size of the transition zone, however you wanna think about those things, is probably increasing as well. Um, and thinking about, um, so also, let me put that another way, the inner arrival time between the flood wave coming from upstream and the flood wave coming from the coast might be decreasing. And then the last thing, and I think this connects with Maurizio's talk and, and I think would be worth further discussion for us all as a group, is um, how or, well, let me back up, adaptation should be considering um, multiple hazards. Um, and we should be thinking about how adaptation strategies that are aimed at reducing a hazard like um, inland flooding could be exacerbating another hazard like compound coastal flooding 
or um, interacting more likely with storm surge in the case of channelization. Um, other adaptation strategies may have unforeseen benefits. So for example, the reservoirs that were built in Houston are actually holding back water, which decreases this interrival time rather than increasing it. So hopefully that wasn't too much of a leap from sort of the land use to the compound flooding. Um, but I do want to leave you on one note, which is that I've only shown, you know, two of the studies that were done in the wake of Harvey thinking about this topic, but there have been a lot of other people working um, in this area and thinking about climate and flood attribution um, and also thinking about some of the meteorology around Hurricane Harvey, as well as development and socioeconomic qualities. So this is just sort of a glimpse into the Harvey world. And I think there's many, many things that we can discuss uh, in, in that respect. So I'll end um, there and uh, see what we might want to talk about as a group. <laughs>